Hi, Law family. We're continuing our book series on Gentle and Lowly, and this week we are currently on Chapter 7. Probably wondering what the uh, cup of espresso has to do with Gentle and Lowly, and the answer is nothing. It's just a PowerPoint template that I chose that looked half decent. As you already know from reading the uh, book up to this point, the theme is about finding Christ's heart and who he truly is through his own statement, I am gentle and lowly in heart. And I just want to share three thoughts that the Lord put on my heart as I was reading this chapter. So, number one, can we truly understand the weight of sin? When we think about sin, we understand the disobedience, that's what it is, it's towards God. And more often than not, we probably think about the consequences of sin and the wrath of God that follows. There's a number of stories in the Bible where the wrath of God is on display, whether it's the flood, Sodom and Gomorrah. And let's be honest, the concept of God's wrath is pretty terrifying. However, if we're in Christ, that's not something we'd ever have to worry about because the wrath of God is reserved for those unrepentant sinners. But when you really think about it, no one really thinks that they're sinners. Ask the average person in the world today and they'll tell you that they're pretty good people. By whose standards are they good? That'll vary from person to person. But at the end of the day, they're not bad people. And good people are usually not burdened by the weight of sin. And why is that? So the author states here that the reason why we can't understand the weight of sin is because of sin itself. Humanity's fall in the Garden of Eden created this mechanism inside of us where we're always on the defensive. Suppose we stole something. By definition, we're a thief. But if we get caught, we'd hire ourselves to be our own lawyers and defend ourselves. And we could see this on full display in the Garden. After Adam and Eve ate from the tree that they were told not to eat from, they felt naked and ashamed and they went into hiding. When God questioned them, instead of owning up to it and repenting, they pretty much lawyered up. God first asked Adam what he did. Adam points the blame at Eve and at God. He says, you know, you know this woman that you gave me? She gave me the fruit and I ate it. He, Adam just absolves himself completely. I didn't create her, you did. You gave her to me, and she gave the fruit to me. Eve was like, you know what, while well, that's a pretty convincing argument, honey, I'd like the record to show that the serpent deceived me, and I ate. And although she didn't explicitly say that the serpent was created by God, it was pretty much implied there. The serpent, on the other hand, being Satan, and he's the epitome of rebellion, he's not even given a chance to respond. And you can clearly see here in the garden that this defense mechanism is at work. And the author says that the only way we can begin to understand the weight of sin is by having a concept of God and his holiness. Number two, how does sin make us feel in light of his holiness? So if we have a glimmer of God's holiness in our mind and realize that we don't live up to his standards, that same feeling that Adam and Eve felt in the garden is probably what we feel. You know, we live in an age where social media is nothing more than a highlight reel. We typically see all the good side, the strengths, the glitz, the glamour that people typically post. You know, weakness is the last thing that we'd like to show. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16 says that we have a high priest who empathizes with our weaknesses. And because of that, we can approach the throne of grace with confidence. What a great paradox that is. You know, grace isn't something that I deserved, but I'm told to approach God's throne of grace with confidence. I can't imagine, you know, when I was younger, of ever approaching my parents and saying, Mom, Dad, I've cut school all week and I failed all my tests. Now I boldly ask for my allowance. I wouldn't be here today if I did something like that. The shame that sin evokes in me does not bring me closer to God. In fact, it drives me away. It drove Adam and Eve into hiding. Guilt and shame are confidence busters. They draw us into retreat and they leave us feeling defeated. In light of our fall, we needed to be picked up. Our sin drove us away from God and when God could have just unleashed his wrath on us and destroyed us, he pursued us instead. So this is where our confidence comes from that if we are in Christ Jesus, there's no condemnation. We're just left with this powerful thought that although my sin drives me further away from God, that same sin draws a holy God closer to me, to rescue me. Number three, how does Christ view our sins? You know, I, I read a post somewhere that said, Jesus and the world are going in two different directions. 
And you know, without even thinking about it, I was pretty much in agreement. The standards of God and the standards of the world are diabolically opposed to each other. But that post lingered in my mind for days because I kept thinking about the thought of Jesus going in the other direction. During the tragedy of 9-11, one of the lasting memories that I have is the common theme among all those people who kept running out of, who were running out of the Twin Towers to save themselves. So many of them recalled that while they were running out of the burning buildings, the firefighters and the police were running into it. If we imagine that burning building as sin, we're overjoyed that Christ came bursting through the doors and saved us from certain death. However, after being saved and realizing the holiness of God, I'm pretty much guilty of probably looking at contempt at the burning building while other sinners are trapped inside. I mean, don't they deserve it because they're in rebellion towards God? Surely my righteous standing with God justifies me walking away, right? But as I head in the other direction, I cringe at the sight of seeing Christ walking by me, heading the opposite way towards the burning building. Then I remember it isn't, a hel- it isn't the healthy that needs a doctor. It's true, some will never leave the burning building of sin. They will choose to die in their rebellion. But what a thought that he would pursue us in light of our sin. And for those of us who are his, he views that sin as a disease. He chooses to dwell within us and fights against that sin with us to keep us righteous. It doesn't mean that he's not going to discipline us when we go astray, because he does, he will. But where there was once condemnation for sins, we're given everlasting life through Jesus. In fact, we're given Jesus himself. And what a Savior he is, and what a wonderful God, an awesome God he is. Well, that's all. I pray that God speaks to you as you read through this chapter, and I encourage you to do that. Have a great week.